Right, welcome everybody to the first session of the RQI uh, 2022 online. The first speaker is no other than Professor Robert Mann. Uh, Rob is uh, the first generation of people working in RQI and uh, one of the founding members of the uh, International Society for Relativistic Quantum Information. So Rob has been kind enough uh, to answer our request that we thought that uh, he could give a brief history of the field which is a relatively new field um, in the big scheme of things. And uh, we thought that nobody but him could be the best introduction to the field. So thank you very much, Rob, for agreeing to our request. And uh, again, you have 20 minutes, uh, 25 minutes, sorry, and uh, the floor is uh, yours. Thank you, Rob. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, Eduardo, for uh, the kind of invitation to speak on this. Um, I'm talking to you from the University of Nottingham, which is where you and I first met each other. Uh, I'm going to be visiting here for a while, uh, arriving yesterday. Um, yeah, how do you talk about the history of a scientific subject that is relatively new? I wondered uh, quite how to do it, and, and I want to be as fair as I can. I'm quite self-conscious about whether or not I might leave somebody out. But it's probably inevitable that maybe somebody's work got missed that should have been mentioned or someone's contribution perhaps should have been better emphasized. So I suppose that's what the Slack channel is for, for the rest of you to correct me or revise what I have to say on certain occasions. So um, relativistic quantum information, as I think everybody knows, is really a subject that involves these three areas of science, quantum physics, relativity, and information, quantum information. And we're interested in the overlap between these, particularly the middle area, but often this area here, this one here, and this one there. Now, how do you present a scientific subject uh, Historically, I thought of the geologic time scale, which I've shown up here, in which time is measured in millions of years. And I took a look at RQI and I discovered you could do roughly the same thing as long as you measure it in millions of seconds. Uh, so we have right now 2022 and uh, the subject started about 550 million seconds ago. Uh, we have an era of prehistory in which quantum field theory and quantum information, I suppose, dominated. And out of this emerged relativistic quantum information. There was a dawn and an emergence period, uh, followed by a period of growth. And now we're in what might be called the frontier era. So... Whenever you talk about history, I find it a bit difficult to know how far back to go. So uh, I am demarking it from the year 2002, uh, 20 years ago. Um, way, way back when, we of course, everyone knows we had classical physics that in the 20th century uh, diverged into two main areas, quantum mechanics and general relativity, out of which grew quantum field theory and the standard model of particle physics and gravitation that we have today. In the 1970s, two key ideas that influenced RQI were the notion that black holes could radiate, Hawking radiation as it's called, and that accelerated detectors, uniformly accelerated detectors, respond as though they are in a thermal bath, now known today as unruh radiation. In the 1980s, a few more ideas came about that I think were precursors to the subject. The notion of a quantum, I should say, Turing machine, uh, I had a spell checker correct me when it shouldn't have, sorry. Uh, the notion of an unruh DeWitt detector came about, which proved to be very important to the subject. Uh, the BB-84 teleportation protocol was constructed. The notion of a sonic black hole was pr proposed by Bill Unruh. Um, Summers and Werner showed the quantum vacuum could ha uh, was actually an entangled structure uh, between the different fluctuations. And uh, Lias Diosi proposed that perhaps gravity could be responsible for collapsing a wave function. 
The black hole information paradox was formulated as was the Transplankian problem of black hole radiation. And then in the 90s, Antony Valentini proposed that perhaps this vacuum entanglement here could be harvested in some way, perhaps by atoms in a, in a cavity. Uh, meanwhile, Peter Shore came up with uh, making use of quantum physics to factorize large numbers, showing this could be done much more efficiently than the standard classical methods. The notion of generalized uncertainty in minimal length came in um, at the risk of sounding immodest in a paper by Kempf, Mangiano, and Mann in 95. Uh, Carlo Rivelli and Lee Smolin were proposing the notion that perhaps quantum mechanics should be understood in relational terms. And following on Diossi's idea, Penrose came up with an estimate of how fast gravity could collapse a superposed wave function. I think all of these ideas have fed into RQI. So the dawn of the subject, I said I demarked at about 2002, though really RQI didn't come in as such until then. But there were three ideas of quantum entropy, vacuum entanglement, and quantum teleportation that gave rise to this relationship between acceleration and entanglement that I guess I might say catalyzed the subject. And I've listed the, the relevant papers here and I uh, copied first the title of this one, which actually came later than, than uh, the very first one. Uh, a guy named Danny Turno worked with Asher Perez and wrote this Reviews of Modern Physics article in which they say the authors, uh, well, which they say this article discusses the intimate relationship between quantum mechanics, information, and relativity theory. Exactly that overlap I mentioned earlier. And they say they discuss how most of the current concepts in quantum information theory may require a reassessment. And in, in fact, I think they were quite right about this. This is, in some sense, what drives our subject today. And here are the uh, excerpts from the titles and abstracts of the three papers I mentioned. Uh, Perez, Scotto, and Turno um, pointed out that the entropy, uh, the quantum entropy of a spin a half particle, is not a relativistic scalar. Meanwhile, Benny Resnick, I think without knowing it, uh, rediscovered Valentini's idea uh, exploring the entanglement of the vacuum of a relativistic field by letting a pair of causally disconnected probes interact with the field. We find that even when the probes are not entangled initially, they can wind up in a final entangled state. And uh, Paul Alsing and Gerard Milburn came very, very close. And in fact, I was at Perimeter when Gerard gave a talk on this uh, work that he did with Paul. And they found that for a pair of observers sharing an entangled state, the fidelity, uh, well, not sharing an entangled state, but uh, an inertial observer wanting to teleport a state to Rob using entanglement where Rob is accelerated, that the fidelity is reduced due to the Davies Unruh radiation in the frame, and their results suggest that quantum entanglement is degraded in non inertial frames. And this uh, led to me approaching Vet Fuentes uh, Schuller at the time and saying, This sounded interesting. What do you think? And she said, Yeah, this is great. And we spent some time working on it. It took us quite a number of months. Uh, we submitted the paper in 04 and it got published almost a year later. We had to revise certain things. Uh, we then followed up this Alice Falls into a Black Hole by looking at entanglement of Dirac fields and non-inertial frames. Paul Alsing actually approached us uh, uh, to try and look at what would happen in the fermionic vacuum. And it's probably well known to most people here, the basic idea was that Alice and the inertial Bob share an entangled state. And we asked, what if Bob is replaced with a uniformly accelerating Rob? And what happens is that the accelerated Rob in the 
bosonic vacuum, uh, that acceleration will cause his detector to perceive a thermal vacuum, either bosonic or fermionic, as is written here. And the uh, Unruh effect uh, causes, well, Rob is causally disconnected from region two, and the Unruh effect basically causes a degradation of entanglement and information. In the bosonic vacuum, the logarithmic negativity decreases as the acceleration goes up and mutual information falls from its maximal inertial value down to its minimal um, value of one where there's no distillable entanglement available. In the fermionic vacuum, something analogous happens to this where negativity declines to uh, the minimum it can as the acceleration approaches its maximal possible value and likewise for other measures of mutual information. So then following that, there's a period of what I call emergence where I, I think what happened with that paper Yvette and I wrote is it seemed to catalyze these earlier ideas and cause people to take a look at various aspects of the relationship between non-inertiality, gravity, uh, and, and uh, quantum information. So we had uh, this idea of quantum reference frames emerge, a view from nowhere as Dixon called it. And Bartlett, Rudolph, and Speckens wrote a well-known paper in which uh, quantum reference frames were quantified. You could begin to do calculations with them. Lucien Hardy proposed in a paper that really wasn't looked at till somewhat later uh, that quantum gravity might require that the order of events is quantum mechanical and can be superposed. And there was a, also a paper by Liberati, Barcello, and Visser uh, on analog gravity, which at the time I don't think they were thinking of RQI, but the ideas there have proven to be quite useful. Uh, but meanwhile, in the emergence of the subject, things like accelerated quantum correlations were looked at, discord, Gaussian quantum physics, as exemplified in the diagram to the left, uh, what would happen to quantum correlations for observers near a black hole. Uh, UDW detectors uh, were studied in much more detail, Yorma Luko being one of the pioneers here with Alejandro Satz, looking carefully at what transitions rates would be like in flattened curve space times. And Baylock Hu and Shi Yun Lin, meanwhile, um, took a look at formulating carefully the action, the stress energy, and quantum flux associated with this two-level Unruh DeWitt detector that was proposed way back in the 80s to demonstrate that uh, Unruh radiation was real enough to roast a steak. And then, of course, uh, quantum correlations were looked at in other ways. Uh, in cosmology um, by Yvette and uh, Eduardo and Shapur Maradi uh, and Jonathan Ball, Frederick Schuller in, the, in two papers. Uh, Versteeg and Manacucci wrote a paper that would prove to be quite in influential for the harvesting aspect where they showed that two quantum detectors could discover more than a single detector uh, could. Gibbons and Hawking showed that uh, the response of a single detector in an expanding universe is indistinguishable from that in a thermal bath at the same temperature, but the correlations between them were not the same. And that led people to realize that in fact you learn more with two detectors than just with one. And here's a diagram where you have a central observer and the two detectors are uh, accelerating away from each other out of causal contact, but the person in the middle in principle could receive the information and deduce the correlations between them. Meetings emerged. Uh, I thought the first one was in 2007, but technically there was a precursor meeting, a quantum gravity workshop uh, that I was not present at, at the Isaac Newton Institute in December of 2004, in which some of the people here that are at this meeting spoke at that one. But Tim Ralph decided uh, at the time he was getting it arrested and thought it would be good to have a, 
uh, a small gathering of people in Australia interested in this thing. And he held it at the elegant Brisbane Cuspins House, showing from the viewpoint of the Brisbane River here. And this meeting has continued ever since. Um, <clears throat> a few years later, just north of the equator in Taiwan, Xi Lin and Bela Ku organized what has now come to be called RQI North, the Brisbane meeting come to be called RQI South. And at that meeting was the founding of the International Society of Relativistic Quantum Information. Baylock, uh, who pushed this idea and said, look, uh, there's enough scientific interest here that we really should form a society in order to hold meetings and to collect the community together. And I, it's had its ups and downs, but I think has by and large been quite successful. Then we entered a growth period where more and more people started working on this subject, doing all kinds of things that I, I have listed here. Things like uh, studying more carefully the single mode approximation that was used in previous studies. Uh, Olson and Ralph showed that you could flip the unroot effect sideways and get past future entanglement. And, and sort of a past-future unroot-type effects. Um, Chirabella and collaborators and Ereshkov, Ereshkov, Kostner, and Bruckner began to look at what would happen to things like quantum computations and quantum correlations if indeed quantum physics gave an indefinite order to space-time events. And they drew little pictures like this uh, to show the difference between definite events and perhaps indefinite events over there. Uh, there was some investigation of tripartite entanglement for accelerating observers. And uh, following on the Versteeg Menacucci paper, what happened was Nick came to Perimeter at that time and gave a talk on this. And I thought this was quite interesting and he was aware of my work. So we had a student, well, I had a student, Grant Salton, that worked with us. And we came up with a paper that studied how you could harvest or how observers in relative acceleration could extract or harvest entanglement from the vacuum. And uh, at the same time, Mar uh, Eduardo and Eric Brown and William Donnelly and Akeem Kemp showed that you could turn this into a farming activity, so to speak. And at one point, Nick actually wrote a long introduction to a paper about hunting and gathering and farming and bringing in the harvest. And eventually we cut it out of the paper because it was a bit distracting, but it was rather amusing. And here's a picture from the farming paper showing that if you sent uh, atoms, uh, two level atoms through a number of cycles, you could eventually extract a certain finite amount of negativity depending on the circumstances. And black holes were looked at in more detail. Alex Smith and I pointed out that you could look at the interior of black holes with uh, UDW detectors, at least indirectly in a way that was not possible in classical physics. And who and you showed at 2011 that black holes actually could suppress entanglement. And more went on. There were uh, papers about testing the Unruh effect, about bringing the notion of metrology into relativistic quantum information by uh, Amadi, Bruschi, uh, Carlos Sabine, uh, Gerardo Adesso, uh, and, and Yvette, and they, they wrote a paper that had a picture like this. Meanwhile, there was a very important result around 2010, I think, 2011 maybe, where uh, horizon radiation was simulated in a water tank experiment by Silke Weinfurtner and uh, uh, Tedford, Penry, Sunru, and Lawrence, in which uh, they very carefully made measurements of the ripples of water using a laser beam to look at the surface and showed indeed that you did have uh, a horizon radiation uh, due to the uh, exceeding the speed of sound in the water in certain parts of the tank. Uh, relativistic quantum computation uh, began to be explored by this group. And the notion of perhaps even detecting gravity waves using a Bose-Einstein condensate was um, given. 
And uh, the notion of localizing a particle itself in the context of generalized uncertainty principles was explored by Bajowald and Kempf. And around uh, 2012, uh, as you can see, there was a, a, um, a review issue of classical and quantum gravity. I happened to be on the board at the time and I suggested this. And at first they were a bit reluctant and I said, look, this is really going to be an interesting thing. And here's a list of the various papers published there, not a fully complete list, but um, uh, most of the main ones. And indeed, many of these papers now are, are quite well cited and form the foundation of a number of things done in the subject. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the work of Masahiro Hara, who pointed out um, in certain physical systems, like spin chains, for example, that you could teleport energy from one part to another. And then working with Rolf Schutzold and Bill Unruh, he showed that you could in fact translate this even to the quantum vacuum uh, in a picture shown from one of their papers here. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the information paradox that also came out around 2012, where the whole notion of a firewall around a black hole was uh, proposed. There have been a many, many papers written on this. In RQI, Yorma Luko and Eduardo showed that you could, in fact, do model tests of this in one plus one dimension using under DeWitt detectors. And Tim Ralph, um, Daishin Su, Marco Ho, and I uh, spun this off to make some circuit models of black hole radiation. Sorry, Rob, five and minutes. here we have a picture. What, how am I doing? Uh, there's I've five got... minutes right now. Yep. Am I at five? Oh, I thought I, okay, right. Uh, you can buy into your question time, too. I, I, I'm, I'm doing it. Entanglement harvesting was discussed in quite a number of papers, and now there's a, a fair amount of work on this. The idea is you have an object like a black hole, and you put a pair of detectors about it with some trajectories, often static, but not necessarily and you see what happens to their correlations. And the answer is something quite different due to the horizon of the black hole. The first detailed study was done by uh, Alejandro Pozas Christians and Eduardo, and there were studies on the topology and an anti de Sitter space, and uh, then in black holes, where in fact first uh, Lee Hodgkinson and Yorma Luko studied how detectors respond outside a two plus one black hole. And then the harvesting uh, uh, was looked at a few years later. And there are other ideas uh, that have been explored. Decoherence from gravitational time dilation, much work on cavity physics uh, by uh, various people here, some of which, uh, which I was involved with. Um, meanwhile, in the lab, Rotational super radiance was observed in fluid dynamics uh, by these groups here, led by Silke Weinfurtner. And uh, here's a picture of how ripples come in at the right, and when they pass a vortex, have this pattern. And you can show this pattern correlates with uh, expected super radiance. And Jeff Steinauer formed an analog black hole out of a Bose-Einstein condensate in which you add an outside a horizon and an inside based on the speed of in the fluid. And so uh, we get to the frontiers area of the subject, which I think have been the last five years, though maybe one should say it's the last three, where lots of interesting ideas are being explored. Um, Caffrey, Taylor, and Milburn um, building off Diossi's ideas proposed that gravity perhaps could be understood as quantum noise, as a classical channel. And uh, it was shown that an experiment by Kasevich looking at um, objects, uh, gravitational freefall of objects in superposition, that this idea can actually rule out, uh, this experiment, sorry, can actually rule out this idea, which we pointed out in this paper here, Magdalena Zeich. Natasha Altamirano, Polita Corona Ogaldi. Tests of the equivalence, quantum tests of the equivalence principle in the lab are being seriously proposed. There is now, as this picture at the lower right shows, the proposal that we could actually have an Unruh DeWitt detector, 
uh, a physical real one made out of a laser beam having two levels in this paper here that came out um, not too long ago. And the notion that about a few years ago that gravity could induce quantum entanglement, that we actually should test whether or not this idea is possible um, because uh, its implications one way or the other are very significant for quantum gravity. There's a whole new subject built out of relational quantum dynamics, quantum reference frames, um, partly motivated by the observation of a temporal quantum switch by the Australian group led by Andrew White. Um, and uh, entanglement can also, or rather indefinite causal order is also, um, uh, uh, has a significant influence on quantum entanglement and can violate various no-go theorems. And of course, the subject goes on in the standard way, but with many new interesting things. Uh, the semi-classical limits of black holes are being explore, explored. We now are beginning to quantify how to, um, in an operational way, what goes on with space-time superpositions as these two pictures uh, demonstrate one from Flaminia Giacomini's paper. Um, people are looking at quantum detectors that are delocalized in space, getting perhaps nearer to real world physics. Dynamical collapse is being looked at. And very recently, uh, Chen Zhang, uh, Kifeng Yormaluko, and I did, I'm quite happy about this, the first computation of the free fall of a UDW detector into a Schwarzschild black hole. So I've run out of time. Uh, that's a very rapid view of the history covering highlights. And uh, for those of you that think if I ever give this kind of talk again, want to make suggestions, I'm very open to them. RQI, what's it about? It's about how relativistic effects influence quantum tasks. It's about testing foundational ideas of gravity and the quantum. Um, or maybe it's about, as Akeem Kemp said at a meeting a few years ago, it's quantum gravity without prejudice. It's been a very interesting last 20 years. I hope the next 20 are just as much fun. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Rob.